Dr. Joseph Graves, thanks so much for coming on to Talk Beliefs all the way from your office in North Carolina. You are a professor in the Department of Biology at North Carolina A&T State University, as well as an author, having just released your latest book, Racism Not Race, Answers to Frequently Asked Questions, along with co-author Professor Alan Goodman, which has already been named as one of the best nonfiction books of the year by Kirkus Reviews. So welcome to the show. I know um, you've been on a bit of a whirlwind tour of interview dates since uh, the publishing of the book. So are you enjoying it? And uh, what has the response to your book been so far? Well, Mark, you, ju you just mentioned that uh, we were named to the Kirkus mm. Review list of best nonfiction um, in 2021. Um, they also included us on their list of best books about being black in America, which was also surprising because quite frankly, wow. our book isn't about being black in America. It, it's about a whole bunch of issues about racism. And, and quite frankly, black folks aren't the only ones who suffer from racism and aren't the only ones who know need to know about how racism works. But yeah, both Al and I have been doing interviews um, in podcasts at universities, giving talks. Um, and we feel that this book is uh, appearing at a very important time um, that may hopefully impact the future of the United States and and the rest of the world for some good, because we are in a moment in history right now. Absolutely. Well, before we get into the topic of race, let's just hear a bit about your academic background. You're an evolutionary biologist and geneticist, but you've also been involved in the world of nanoscience. Uh, isn't that right? Uh, yes, Mark. Um, it was a complete and thorough um, accident that I happened to get involved in research relevant to understanding how nanomaterials um, impact living systems. But because I came at this question from the point of view of my training in evolutionary genetics, I was able to, to see things that other people didn't see. Specifically, um, I immediately challenged the dogmatic position that bacteria would not be able to evolve resistance to silver nanoparticles and demonstrated with a very simple experiment within 30 days that bacteria could evolve resistance to nanoparticles. And it happened quite, quite you know, simply with regard to the underlying genomics of it. And that led me to build a major research group that focused on the question of microbial evolution writ large, hmm. but also specifically how bacteria and viruses respond to both ionic and nanomaterial metals. And as a result of that, I re just last year published a book with Elsevier um, uh, called Principles and Applications of Antimicrobial Nanomaterials. And this book has the potential to be paradigm shifting because the folks doing this research really don't understand the evolutionary aspects of it and, and why they should be paying attention to that. You completed your PhD in evolutionary, environmental, and systematic biology at Wayne State University in 1988, and were then awarded the president's postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California a few years later. But as a child, you found yourself racially sidelined within your school system and not expected to achieve. So. Tell us about that. Yeah, I was born one year after Brown versus Board of Education, um, which <clears throat> forced American schools to integrate. Um, in the state in which I was living, um, New Jersey, New Jersey had actually integrated its public schools a couple of decades before that. But, you know, integrating schools with regard to, you know, having um, black and brown children in the schools and actually having thought about what it meant to, you know, try to educate people um, in ways that were equitable is something that they, they hadn't really done. And they began with the assumption that black and brown students were intellectually inferior compared to white students. And so when I entered school, and of course being a child, I, I didn't really understand the ideological basis of why I was being treated differently, but I could definitely tell that I was being treated differently. Um, the work that I was given was just not challenging for me. And as a result of it not being challenging, um, the teachers saw me as a behavioral problem. 
you know, if you if you put a five year old child in a classroom, mm -hmm. little boy for that matter, and he finishes his work in a snap because it's not at all challenging to them, what do you think that child's going to do? Are they going to sit still? No, of course not. And so it took a couple of years before they realized that instead of dealing with a mentally slow child, they were actually dealing with a child of rather advanced ability. Um, and it happened um, in the library when, uh, a, when a student teacher noticed that I was reading a, a large book with no pictures. Now, all the other children in my grade were, were reading books like Fun with Dick and Jane and, and so forth. But I was sitting there reading a copy of Harold Lamb's The Crusades, Iron Man and Saints. And so the other teachers had assumed that when I opened these big books, that in fact I was showing out because I really couldn't read. But this mm -hmm. teacher sat down next to me and actually asked me about the book and said, well, little boy, what are you reading about? And so I told her the entire story of the first, second, and third crusades, who the key players were, why, why they were doing what they were doing, uh, and so forth, and who, what my favorite you know, moments were in, in this historical drama. And, and the look on that woman's face, if I, if I could recreate it for your listeners, would be like, you know, WTF, what's going on here? And so after that, the next day I found myself in the advanced learning group. Now, um, I tell that whole story in my newest book, the one that's going to be published by BASIC in the fall of 2022 called A Voice in the Wilderness. A pioneering biologist explains how evolution can help mm -hmm. us solve our biggest problems. Now, that book has a lot of autobiographical material in it, although it's not really an autobiography. But uh, that has been, was an issue that I faced throughout my entire career of racial assumptions about what my capacity was. And, and, and I'll end on, on this note, that even after I had become a respected scientist, that those same racial ideological um, uh, roadblocks were thrown in the way of my children, particularly my oldest son, mm -hmm. who was a late talker, and they assumed that he was mentally retarded. And, and when they came to, to you know, examine my son at the house, I told them, you do know that there are two theories about late talking children. One is that they have some sort of developmental delay. And the other is that they're actually a genius. And why do you assume that my son has a developmental problem when he's in, you know, nothing he's done has indicated to us that he doesn't understand what we're saying to him, that he's incapable of doing particularly high, very high capacity mathematics, even when he was, you know, five years old. And of course, when he started talking, he started talking in full sentences, and he turned out to be mathematically precocious and ended up in all the advanced mathematics courses throughout his training and ended up earning a degree in math from Duke University um, in 2012. But despite all this, it's, it's uh, inspired the work that you're doing now. Yes. I mean, you know, when one actually lives structural racism, you have a different perspective on it than people who just study it as an academic challenge. You are a scientist and evolutionary biologist, and your work is governed by hard evidence and based upon agreed scientific concepts. Now, there is a claim out there among scholars that race is not a scientific concept, but you argue that it definitely is. So what were your conclusions about this? Yes, I mean, the statement that you'll often hear from social scientists and humanists um, is that there's no such thing as race or race is not a scientific concept. And that is, in fact, um, incorrect. Uh, the notion of biological races has a long history in biology. Um, naturalists um, going back to the third century BCE were interested in studying variation in living things. Um, they did not create the race concept that we now know in the 20th century, but for the entire time in which biologists were looking at organisms, they understood that variability was part of, of what you needed to understand about them. Now, the biological race concept 
uh, has gone through several iterations, um, starting first with just the physical attributes of organisms, then um, where they could be found geographically around the world. In the 20th century, particularly with the coming of the neo-Darwinian synthesis, um, concepts of race had to do with the uh, amount of genetic variation within groups versus between groups. And later on in the 20th century, um, biological race was defined by phylogenetic techniques. Now, what I have consistently said about the biological race concept when applied to, to humans, our species, is that our species does not have biological races. There are plenty of species that do, including other large-bodied mammals like Grant's gazelle or gray wolves in North America. Um, but the important thing to understand is you really can't say that one species doesn't have biological races unless you actually have a set of criteria that you use to make that determination. And so using modern evolutionary methods, we conclude that our species doesn't have biological races. We do have geographically based genetic variation, um, but not enough to unambiguously um, apportion groups of people into biological races. That's simply not something you see in our species. Okay, uh, here's a question that I know you've been asked many times before, but I think it's an important one. And that is the difference between ethnicity and race. Uh, another way to ask this would be, how does biological race differ from socially constructed race? Right, well, let's first get a clearer definition of what's meant by ethnicity. Um, ethnicity typically refers to a group of people with a shared national origin, um, with a shared religion, uh, and often a shared um, set of religious practices. Now, that's not the same as socially defined race. Socially defined race may use attributes of ethnicity in its definition, but that's not the only thing it does. It also will use physical, physical traits. It will also use um, a supposed ancestry. And it's somewhat random with regard to how socially defined race concepts or criteria are constructed. But the key thing to understand about socially defined race is that it was designed for one purpose and one purpose only, which was to create a hierarchy of human beings within given societies to determine who had human rights, who had civil rights, um, who counted with regard to how that society operated. Um, that can often occur with, with ethnic groups as we saw, for example, in the history of Europe and the Holocaust. Um, but yes. it need not occur that way for ethnic groups. What about genetic diversity between individuals and populations? Now, the assumption is that people of a particular ethnic background are probably more similar to each other than they are to other ethnic groups. But that's not exactly what the data shows, is it? Well, the first thing to understand is that there is very little genetic variation within the human species. Any two individuals chosen at random from any parts of the world will share anywhere between 99.1 to 99.9 percent .9 of their genetic information in common. Now, let's be clear that people shouldn't jump up and down about this uniformity in that when you're talking about a genome of 3.3 billion base pairs, that still leaves a lot of base pairs that can be different, mm -hmm. even in that you know, 0.1 to 0.9%. And so what we do know about human genetic variability is that it is geographically based. Populations that are closest to each other share more genes in common, or more genetic variants in common than populations that are more distant from each other. But the key thing to understand is that, that this is a continual change in variant frequency across geographical distance. Mm -hmm. So you, what you don't see are clusters of groups that are strongly genetically different from their neighbors. What we see is a smooth continuity. And that's even when we throw into the mix things like barriers to human migration, like the Sahara Desert or the Himalaya Mountains or the oceans, human beings throughout our entire existence 
have been able to cross barriers um, regularly and end up reproducing with people from other places than the places they were born. And that capacity has maintained strong uniformity throughout the human species. And so once again, when we talk about ethnic groups, we're not really talking about genetically defined groups. And so we don't really want to use ethnicity as a proxy for genetic variability because that just doesn't work at all. Most of the beliefs surrounding so-called race stem from physical differences between peoples, be it skin color, face shape, eye color, and so forth. So what does the science say about the genetic differences between the various peoples of Earth? Aren't we all simply homo sapiens? Well, I mean, let's start with the physical traits, because those are the things that people see. Um, clearly, people of tropical ancestry have darker skin than tro people of temperate and Arctic ancestry. And, and there's a reason for that. You know, our species, mm. anatomically modern humans, evolved in Africa. And that was around 300,000 years ago. Mm. Now, for the majority of the time that this species existed, it existed only in Africa. So 200,000 of those years were spent only there in a relatively small circumscribed geographical region. As the ice age began to recede and climate changed and ways out of East Africa began to open up, people began to migrate around the world. Now this migration didn't occur overnight. It took tens of thousands of years. So one of the things that most people don't realize is that when the first anatomically modern humans came into Europe, they still had African physical features. Yeah. It took tens of thousands of years for lighter skin to evolve in Europe. And that's one of the things that, that you know, always confuses students who think it's that darker skin evolved from lighter skin. It's actually the other way around. Lighter skin evolved from darker skin. Genetic traits like blue eyes are only about 6,000 years old. Okay, things like blonde hair, again, maybe, you know, depending upon which part of the world you're in. For example, Melanesian blonde hair is probably older than blonde hair in Europe, which, again, is around 6,000 years old and, and it's somewhat older in Melanesia. But Melanesians have dark skin and blonde hair, whereas Northern Europeans will have light skin and blonde hair. So the point is that neither hair color or type nor skin color can be used to define biological races within our species. And that, that's one of those earliest mistakes that people had because they were only looking at a small portion of human biological diversity when they, when they started coming up with these schemes. So people like Blumenbach and Linnaeus and, and so on weren't really examining all of the, the diversity of human physical uh, traits in what we would consider a scientific way in the 20th century. So then when we look at the underlying genetic variation, which accounts for these physical differences, then we find there's even less of that and even less of a capacity to try to use that genetic variability to, again, define groups of people who are biological races. So in fact, when we look at the nature of adaptation in our species, we really have only a few things, a few systems that show strong evidence of adaptation, such as skin color, um, mm -hmm. Things like anti-malarial adaptation, things like lactase persistence, which occurs oh, both yes. in Europeans and in Africans. Okay? But these things are minor compared to, again, the large number of 20,000 or so protein coding genes in the human genome. The fact that there's adaptation in maybe, you know, a dozen or slightly more, um, that which we can really hang our hat on, indicates, again, how uniform we actually are. And I know that there was more than one uh, exit, as it were, out of Africa, at least three, I think. And uh, some of them didn't even go into the northern latitudes. And they've, uh, they've remained relatively dark skinned. Is that right? That's absolutely true. People who migrated along the tropics retain their dark skin. And some that move back to the tropics from temperate and Arctic regions began to evolve darker skin again when they got to the tropics. Mm -hmm.
Dr. Graves, we've all seen the rise of white supremacy across the world in America and other countries. I've interviewed two ex-white supremacists on this channel. So what do you think is the overall purpose behind white supremacy and how does evolutionary biology play into these beliefs? Well, white supremacy um, is an ideological tool to maintain the social uh, status quo. Um, it has its roots in the European voyages of colonization. Now, one should take a step back and recognize how the vast majority of Europeans were treated under feudalism, in which ideological props for their oppression, such as the divine right of kings, were in place to keep the European feudals working to enrich their nobility, literally taking their lives to fight wars against other nobles so they could sack their castles and, and take their wealth. But none of that was beneficial to the farmer or to the soldier, the foot soldier, who ends up dying to maintain the status of the ruling class. Yes. So when they went to the new world, they now had to recruit the people that they used to oppress in feudalism to be their vassals in conquering these new populations that they were just coming in contact with. So, you know, carrying out the transatlantic slave trade, massacring the Amer Indians in the Caribbean. And so these experiences gave the ones doing it a sense of their superiority, you know, for reasons that, you know, don't really make a whole lot of sense when you think it through. The fact that you have, you know, steel and iron weapons and the people that you're murdering have wooden ones doesn't necessarily make you a better human being. In my mind, of course, the fact that you're carrying out these acts makes you a much worse human being. So associated with colonization and slavery was an ideology to justify it. These people are less than us. First, it's a creationist ideology. So in other words, God created separate Adams and Eves, and some of them were lower on the totem pole than others, since after all, in their mind, God was white. Then once natural selection and evolution comes along, the ideological basis for white supremacy shifts from a religious foundation to a quasi-scientific one, anyway, what I argue is a pseudo-scientific one. And, but this, the key point here is that white supremacy was maintained, again, for the reasons of colonialism and imperialism and the extraction of wealth from both the white working class and the non-white working class. Because what better way to maintain a system of injustice than to, to keep those most oppressed by it at each other's throats? And so the rise of neo-fascism, which both Alan and I are of the mind, you know, putting Neo in front of it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Because it's the same fascism that we saw in the middle of the 20th century, just being conducted by a new group of people. Yeah. But fascism and, and racial ideology are so deeply tied to each other that, you know, one doesn't survive without the other. So at a time at which you know, the economy is going through a dramatic shift, particularly in the United States, where jobs that used to be comfortable, used to give comfortable living to the working class are disappearing. Those manufacturing jobs are gone. And even more of those manufacturing jobs are being, being automated. And so people now are looking for an excuse. They're looking for, why is this happening to me? And so what our, what our you know, ruling class provides them with, oh, as in the words of Donald Trump, it's because of these immigrants. It's because of these black people, these inferior people who are taking your jobs. And so instead of turning at the system, which is causing their oppression, they're being turned again as weapons against people who have really nothing to do with it. And in this way, those who are in control are trying to solidify, and, and, and there's, I would say, a real danger that democracy 
in the Western world can fall because of white supremacy. That's why Al and I wrote this book, because we think we're in one of those moments similar to the late 1930s in Europe when people had a chance to stop Hitler, but instead joined with him, including people like Winston Churchill, who thought that Hitler was a better option than the Bolsheviks. We're in one of those moments now where if we do not take action against white supremacy, democracy could fall. And I, I honestly thought I would never say this um, in the United States. And, and of course, when I say democracy in the United States, I mean the, the thin veneer of democracy can fall and, and, and we could establish a racialist state. Absolutely. And getting back to uh, the the, uh, the religious aspect of it, um, a lot of white supremacists are, are they, they align with religion or say they do, but that's it's it's easy to understand why they they eschew evolution because it has such a different uh, uh, take on ethnicity. And um, well, as you said, uh, re the religious, they tend to think that, you know, there's a master race, God is, God is white, and so forth. But when you look at evolution, everything starts in Africa. So that's very, that's very, very challenging for them. Well, it's not as challenging as you think. I mean, because once again, the, the utility of ideologies like white supremacy is they don't have to make sense. So if, if, we, if we were able to simply defeat them by using logic and critical thinking, mm -hmm. then, then we wouldn't be where we're at today. White supremacists can easily justify, well, the, the, yeah, life, humans started in Africa, but as in the, as the, the Lamarckians thought, that evolution occurred at a faster rate in Europe, and so Europeans became superior. So both of these, you know, explanations, creationist or evolutionary, can be used to service white supremacy. One isn't better than the other in that regard. But the key thing is that I, I see white supremacy as both bad religion and bad science, because if we examine what the faith of most of the people in the world hold, you know, whether you're Christian, Jew, or Islamic, most of the faith, of the faith communities in the world recognize the unity of the human species and also the value in the lives of all human beings. So to come up with these racist Aryan religions you're basically going against the entire tradition of, of religious thought in the Western world. So I guess what you're saying, uh, if they're dedicated to their bad ideas, they're dedicated to them no matter what. That's correct. And there's like little or no evidence that I could present to a fascist to convince them that what they're doing is, is scientifically or morally incorrect. We didn't write this book for those people. We wrote this book for people who have a, a desire to live in a world of justice, peace, and equality. And, and Alan and I still believe that that's the vast majority of the world's people. And to provide those people with a tool to be able to work for real justice and equity in the neighborhoods and the communities that they live in. And that's how we defeat the fascists, okay, by not giving in to their calls for hate. You've written three books on the subject of race, uh, with a fourth on the way, as you've said. Dr. Graves, what inspired you to write these books and what thoughts, words, and actions do you hope ultimately they'll inspire? Well, in the late 1990s, I began to question why people thought racially. And again, this was motivated by my training in, in evolutionary genetics. It was very clear to me, looking at human biological variation, that we didn't have biological races. But yet this message which had surfaced at various times in Western society. So I'm certainly not the first person to say this. I mean, in 1942, Ashley Montague wrote Race, Mankind's Greatest Myth. And this was, again, during World War II when race science was trampling across Europe. And it, while the so-called Western democracies were no better in terms of their attitude towards race than the Nazis were. In fact, you know, when, when Roosevelt used to say to Hitler, you know, that he was concerned about how the Nazis were treating the Jews, 
Hitler would turn around to Roosevelt and said, you know, we'll treat our Jews better when you start treating your Negroes better. So this idea, this fundamental scientific truth is, is not new. After the war, the United Nations Educational Scientific Cultural Organization, UNESCO, put together two statements on race, one published in 1950 one published in 1951. But neither of these ever found any traction in the United States. The United States was still heavily engaged in racial segregation. And I remember a headline um, on the New York Times saying scientists, world scientists find no basis for race, counterposed against all of the racist things that the American society was doing to black and brown people and you know who, and the presidents who were carrying these things out the legislatures which were supporting segregation and you know, preventing african-american students to enter schools in arkansas and mississippi and alabama all this is going on while the science is clearly accumulating demonstrating well the, the kinds of biological differences that you're basing your segregationist policies on are just not real. And the United States still is a structurally racist nation, despite the fact that over the 20, the latter portion of the 20th century, the early portion of the 21st century, we have definitively demonstrated the non-existence of biological races in the human species. And that all of these claims about personality and intel intelligence are not based upon any real science predominantly on ideology. So again, we're at a moment where there's a reality of the human condition of what, what we are. And then there's the mythology. And the mythology seems to be gathering steam. Okay, that mythology was behind the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. Confederate flags flew prominently during that attack on an election. And what, again, bothers me the most is that the U.S. government is taking no action, no serious action against those who stimulated the march on the Capitol, mm. the riot in the Capitol, and doing nothing against these people. And, and again, when, you, when you, you put that together, if there are no consequences for Trump and Giuliani and, and the rest of his supporters for attempting to overthrow the U.S. government. And what happened on January 6th, as, as one of the um, political commentators on CNN said this morning, and what happened on January 6th is just a rehearsal for when they will take over the government. It's such an important subject and one that you've tackled very articulately, and I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk with us today. I will leave links to your books and social media in the description below, and all that's left to say is thank you very much indeed for coming on to Talk Beliefs. Thank you, Mark, for having me, and, and I hope at some point I get a chance to talk with your audience again uh, when my next work comes out in fall of 2022. Absolutely.